Good day, grade 11s. My name is Kaden Mazzokere. I'm the author of the Distinction Bound Student Textbooks. I've written Economies grade 10, 11, and 12. This lesson is coming from my grade 11 textbook, uh, the Distinction Bound Student grade 11. I've also published Business Studies grade 11 and 12 for Mr. Tawiz Arashoko. Now, in this lesson, we are going to introduce um, Secular Flow. Of course, you've done circular flow in grade 10, but we're going to dig deeper. Uh, this is one of the most important uh, topics uh, that will mainly prepare you for grade 12. So what we're going to do, uh, the whole topic is going to have 15 lessons all in all. And out of the 15 lessons, we divide them into four uh, units. The first unit we're going to do C. So C, that is our final consumption spending by households. So we're going to go deeper. So our lesson 11, I'll tell you just now when I'm done giving you the whole overview of the topic. Right, unit number two is going to be G. Uh, G is final consumption spending by government. And then unit three, it's I, that's gross capital formation. Uh, then the last unit, that will be our main aggregates. We're going to look at gross uh, GVA, that's cross value added. We're going to look at um, cross national expenditure, cross national income and all that. So all the main aggregates, we're going to look into that. So talking about today's lesson, in today's lesson, which is lesson number 11, like I said already, uh, we're going to look at the definition of C, which is final consumption spending by households. We're going to look at the composition or classification and then we're going to conclude the lesson by looking at the importance. So um, see you just after the break, after the intro. And during the intro, please uh, subscribe if you haven't subscribed to the channel. And also like the video because you're going to learn a lot from it. Thank you so much. I'll see you right after the break. So we normally start with um, revision of homework, but in this particular lesson, we're not going to do so because in the previous lesson, it was a test and I don't normally give homework after a test. So previous lesson was lesson number 10 and uh, we, we, we gave you a test. And so after that, it's a homework free day. So let's just dive into the lesson of the day. So today we're moving on to lesson number 11, as you can see. So we're going to uh, define uh, consumption, final consumption expenditure by households. We're going to look at its composition and classification uh, of yes, that's C. So let's get down to business. So um, we, we, we introduced you to, we, to secular flow actually in grade 10. And uh, I think if you remember, there was uh, a time when we taught you that C plus I plus G plus X minus M, and we put this in brackets. Uh, we say this is our model equation for GDP. Okay, so here we're going to go deeper and give you uh, clearer, uh, clearer understanding. So in grade 10, you learned about the secular flow of income. Uh, let us recap some of the concepts that you learned and, and obviously we're going to give you more insight. A secular flow model is a model that shows how participants in an economy interact. As we all know, in our economy, we have households who happen to be the main participants and the consumers of goods and services. We also have businesses who happen to be the main producers. By main producers, we production is not only done by businesses, government can also produce. But the difference uh, between the two is that businesses will produce uh, goods and services or private goods and services where government will provide us with public goods and services. The difference between the two uh, is that Private goods and services are excludable and they're also rivalry. I'm not going to explain what that means right now. And then uh, public goods and services are non-excludable and they are also non-rivalry. And then we also have the foreign sector and an economy that doesn't include or involve the foreign sector is said to be a closed economy. And I don't think there is a country that has a closed economy. But in grade 10, we teach you a circular flow in that way. Uh, yes, because uh, actually when we start even in grade nine EMS, somewhere there, 
down there in EMS, we even do a two sector model. So as uh, we move on, we then introduce you to a four sector model, which is the whole complete thing. In grade 10, you do uh, a closed economy, but yes, now let's talk about an open economy, one which has all four participants. Well, we have a fifth participant, which is not a main participant, and that's why you don't see it there. It is the financial sector. Okay, so let's just leave it there. So our model equation is therefore C plus G plus I plus X minus M. C, that is our final consumption expenditure by households. G, that's our government spending. I, that's our residual um, uh, cross capital formation. I'm saying residual cross capital formation or investment spending by businesses. X, that's our exports, and M, that's our imports. So we add exports because, yes, our goods are going out, but money comes in because here we are looking at money and not the flow of goods. And then we subtract imports because when goods come into our country, money goes out of the country. So that's why we, we subtract that. All right, moving on. Uh, now, each of the components on our equation are going to be discussed in depth, like I've already said, for clearer understanding. Right, let's move on to the definition. So what is it? Consumption expenditure or spending is the amount of money spent by households in an economy. So how much is it that we uh, spend? Well, uh, we, we spend obviously depending on uh, how much money we get, but it's not always the case uh, because there's a concept that I'm going to introduce that, uh, just now. You, you are going to see that concept and um yeah it's it's a concept around autonomous consumption and induced consumption you are going to see it just now and see what it's all about well the spending uh the spending that we as households do uh includes durable goods uh goods that will last for a long time uh i normally want to give a car as an example because uh like now you can go online you'll see someone is selling a 2000 uh model or a 1980 or you know we have all those vintage cars so those cars have been around for years but they are still driving so it goes to say they are durable then we are going to also we also spend on semi-durable goods these are goods that can be used for more than once but not for a very long time i normally want to give a pen as an example there because yes uh, some things are arguable you know uh you may want to put clothes there yes it's true but I, I i try by all means to avoid such uh because someone will tell you oh i've been wearing these sneakers for years now because they are original something like that so they they can argue and tell you so they are what they are durable so i want to run away from such and so i normally want to use a pen as an example and then last but not least we have non-durable goods these are goods that can only be used once and a good example there is food so in other words it is the purchasing of goods and services by individual households so it is the largest part of aggregate demand yes that is true uh, at the macroeconomic level the total spending of all households on consumer goods and services is called total or aggregate consumption expenditure or simply total consumption right um let, let me now take you to wh what i was talking about so we use the symbol c as you can see there to indicate total uh, consumption or consumer spending in the economy now take note that a symbol is merely an abbreviation or shortened or or or, or shorthand for a, a concept or a variable like in economics we use a lot of symbols now there's this thing that i do with uh, grade 12s uh, where uh, actually i have it also for grade 11s uh, i have a document called an oh, it's not an exam bank uh, i call it a mini workbook so one of part of the sections that the the matrix will struggle with is uh what what do the following symbols stand for and one of them is c and so when i give them uh they'll they'll nail the likes of y they know y is income they know g stands for government spending t stands for tax things like that but when it comes to c they normally get it wrong and when i mark them wrong they think i'm being unfair or they think i'm being too strict for nothing but let me clear this out 
Well, C does. Uh, the reason I'm saying this is because in most cases you'd find learners who write C stands for consumption, of which it's wrong. C is not consumption. C is con uh, consumption spending. Now they say, but come on, the difference is just the word spending. But yes, that difference makes a huge. That that small difference that you see there makes a huge difference because uh, consumption is like. Uh, eating a pie consumption spending is buying a pie so there's a big difference uh, many people can are able to drive cars so when you drive a car you are consuming a car right but not so many people are able to to do the c which is buy a car so buying a car that's the c it's not driving the car so if i'm making myself clear c it's consumption spending. C, it's buying a car. It's not driving a car. C is flying. No, no, no. It's buying an aeroplane and not flying an aeroplane. C is buying an apple. It's not eating an apple. I, I hope I make myself clear there. So C is not consumption. C is consumption spending but yes you can say consumption expenditure you are saying the same thing right there right there are two components of consumption in the basic model well the first one is what we call induced consumption uh, i'm shortly going to give you an example just now which is affected by the level of income and the other one is in uh, is autonomous uh, consumption which is not affected by the level of income or it it can also happen even when income levels are at zero uh i'm, I'm also going to sort of draw something uh don't put it in in your head that much uh, because it's mostly grade 12 uh content but uh, i'll draw a certain graph just quickly not to confuse you but just to explain a certain concept but for now let me give you an example i'm going to use two goods just now uh, that uh, could clarif clarify the difference between induced consumption and autonomous consumption then i'm going to give you even more differences between the two so yes let's let's see the the example so to let you understand the difference between autonomous consumption and induced consumption, I want to give you two goods uh, and I want you to try and think which of the two do you think is induced and which of the two do you think is autonomous? Well, before you uh, try and think, uh, let me say this first. Uh, induced consumption, this consumption that is uh, affected by the level of income and autonomous, it's consumption that is not affected by the level of income. Well, let me give you a car and food. So which one do you think uh, consumption on a car? Because consumption spending on a car, that means buying a car and uh, consumption spending on food, that means buying food. So which one do you think is affected by the level of income and which one do you think it's not affected by the level of income? Well, if your thinking and reasoning is correct, uh, you should uh, come to the conclusion that uh, when purchasing a car is an example of induced consumption because when income levels are low, uh, we don't really buy cars because uh, they are... They, we, we can we can do without them let me put it that way but let's say we come to a point where our income levels are at zero like no income coming whatsoever are you going to buy a car when you are in such a situation obviously not think about what's going on currently uh, during this lockdown uh, will you be buying cars when your income is at zero and you lost your job you have no source of income obviously you wouldn't be buying cars but uh, we we've been in lockdown since last year so we've believed for a year that means everyone who's alive today has been spending on food now that is a typical example of autonomous consumption because that is consumption that is not affected by the level of income so even when income levels are at zero we um we are going to make use of our savings we are going to make uh, we are going to borrow from financial institutions, from family, from friends. We are going to sell cars, right? 
uh, that we bought when things were still okay and then we sell the cars you get let's say two hundred thousand you use that money to buy food uh, not all of it but you probably put it in an account and then every time month after month you 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 purchase groceries so this uh, is a typical example of the or, or a, a thing that can show us the difference between autonomous and induced so to wrap it up induced consumption uh, it is affected by the level of income this is uh, cons this is uh, spending that is affected by the level of income and autonomous this is spending that is not affected by the level of income i hope you understand this right as you have seen from the example if income levels are actually zero autonomous consumption counts as a de-saving now this word de-saving means uh, we are making use of our savings okay uh, because it is financed by borrowing it can also be uh, financed by borrowing so we could even ask for money from just like you saw from my example uh, we we are going to need food regardless whether we got paid or we didn't get paid we uh, there are so many people who haven't been earning an income of uh, you know and in some cases like here in South Africa we have social grants social grants uh, okay fine they'll sort of work as a, a source of income but look there's someone who has lost their job and their income level is at zero and then there are ways so government is helping so yeah it it actually can work as an example where we have this uh, autonomous consumption uh, working right um autonomous consumption contrasts with induced consumption in that it does not simultaneously fluctuate with income what we mean by this is uh, when income levels go up induced consumption goes up when income levels go down um induced consumption goes down autonomous consumption has nothing to do with uh, income levels uh, but one thing that could maybe affect autonomous consumption is things like wealth maybe uh, maybe due to change in wealth maybe due to an inheritance or, or let's say people have inherited or you know fine we're not talking about one person here we're talking about the economy as a whole let's say south africans they are just wealthier than they were before so their autonomous consumption could go up that's what i'm saying there so it has nothing to do with income but it it could be affected by other things like i'm giving here an example of wealth so the level of wealth can change our autonomous consumption well it's difficult for me to sort of explain uh without using that graph i was talking about so uh, i'll draw it just now just to make you understand what i'm talking about so uh the the two uh the two as an autonomous and induced are related for all households uh through the consumption uh function right so we have c which stands for our consumption spending or total consumption is equal to um c underscore zero which in this case is uh, autonomous consumption in other cases you would see it written as c bar like this one uh, but it's the same thing that we are doing uh, plus c underscore one uh, which in this case is our marginal propensity to consume uh, and times yd which happens to be our disposable income all right so let me sort of show you what what i was uh, referring to so here we have our axis for consumption and here we have our axis for income so if uh we okay so this is i have to put a zero here because this zero is going to indicate that okay fine uh we are having zero on the y-axis and zero on the x uh, axis right so this is when income is at zero and y is at zero and uh, we all know that there is going to be that um 45 degree line uh which shows uh, all the points where income is at income and consumption are at equilibrium or income and expenditure are at equilibrium right so they there's going to be a point somewhere on the consumption axis where we have our uh, what do you call it what's this one where we have our autonomous consumption so that will be c underscore zero 
or I can say C bar, whatever it is that I can use. Okay, so this point here, this whole section here uh, indicates our autonomous consumption. So if you heard me correctly, there was a time when I said uh, this autonomous consumption can change, yes, but it doesn't change due to anything with, uh, like the change doesn't have anything to do with our income. And so our C, uh, our autonomous consumption can be higher. It can also be lower. Uh, whatever it is that could cause it, has, it's, it's actually not the level of income because uh, it's not like induced consumption, which can be affected by the level of income. Right, so now the relationship between our income and um, uh, the induced consumption, when income goes up, it also goes up so from from our um, disposable income no, now i'm saying disposable income from our autonomous consumption which is c underscore zero there we 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 can draw a line okay fine it was going to intersect my line of equilibrium somewhere uh but yeah it's fine i can just draw it like this so i can say c here and so this is actually our marginal propensity to consume this one here let's say 0 0.8 meaning that if our mpc is going up uh, if for every one rent that you get you probably spend 80 cents of that and here it's showing that for every one rent that i get i spend 80 cents so on this side here this side here this is my income and this side here it's my spending so for every one rent i get i spend 80 cents of it so this here it will be like this so it can shift depending on what's going on if there's an injection in the economy but well uh, all i wanted to show here was this autonomous consumption thing well we'll go in depth with this when we get to grade 12. all right moving on Households final consumption expenditure includes the following con components. Number one, households purchase on durable goods. We talked about these durable goods before. And then our purchase of non-durable, our purchase of semi-durable, and our purchase of oh, services that are rendered to us. Okay, so household final consumption expenditure is not an exhaustive, exhaustive um, measure of the goods and services consumed by us. This means that uh, what, uh, what you see, the figure you see there is not all that we consume because there are other things that we consume that we probably don't pay for. That's simply what we are saying there because it could be government that has given those things to us or something like that. And that's what I'm explaining down there. And here's an example of what I'm saying. You can go through the example. Okay, so let's conclude by looking at this table here. It shows our final consumption expenditure by households at current prices. And this is one of the concepts that we are going to uh, go deeper with uh, by the end of secular flow you are going to clearly understand the difference between current prices and constant prices okay i'm not going to explain it right now but yes that's one thing i can say another thing that i can point out is whenever you read such tables take note of uh, what's written in rands uh, in some cases you will see r and then you see three zeros what it what it means is any figure you see in the in, in the table you must add three zeros after that so for instance this this number here if we had three zeros after this number this number will be read as 185 million four hundred and thirty six thousand okay but in this case we actually have six zeros because if you see after r we have a million so it's a figure like this one here so we have three zeros three zeros now it's six and then another three now it's nine so this figure is actually 185 billion 436 million that's how you should read it okay but not to make things uh complicated you can just write one eight five four three six m and take note i've already put my r 
so don't leave out the r and i put my m so my figure will be correct so whenever you are asked to calculate uh, or, or add whatever it is that they want if you have to write down an answer make sure your answer has the rand symbol and make sure it also has the million or if you don't want to put the million you can put six zeros and take note in it's not always million in some cases it's three zeros so you just do what you see all right so let's see here let's try to learn or let me try to discuss this table and sort of help you i'm going to use the year 2014 all right so how much did uh household consumption expenditure on durable goods contribute to our total expenditure on on goods and services well we spent 199 billion or 199.8 billion we we can say it like that right uh 199.8 billion rands on durable goods and uh, that number went up in 2015 and then how much did we spend on semi-durable goods we spent 182.6 billion rands and how much did we spend on non-durable goods we spent 926.3 billion rands so we spent more money on non-durable goods so you see here um, you will see even when you get to grade 12 when we do inflation you are going to see that um, uh, what a, a change in price for non-durable goods is grossly going to affect uh, the the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. You are going to see that when you get to grade twelve. But let's just leave it there. Uh, I'm just pointing it out because yes, I don't just teach grade eleven. I also teach grade twelve. So there's certain things that I mention in grade eleven that I know when I mention them, I'm preparing you for grade twelve. All right, so this is what we have, but this is not everything. Uh, just try to keep these figures in your head. Then we add this up with what we have on the next slide, which happens to be services. Because yes, we don't just spend on goods. We also spend money on services. So as you can see here, we spent around about the same on services as we did on non-durable goods. So all in all we spent more money on goods than we did on services because look at 2013 900 uh 930 billion was spent on uh was spent on what on services that means the rest was spent on goods which happens to be more than uh 50 percent uh on on goods okay so that is what you see there and uh that's how you so in an exam what if they give you such a table uh what questions could you expect well you can expect questions like calculate the percentage contribution by services to final consumption expenditure by households for 2013 so what you do there is you take 930 930 788m divided by two one that is actually two trillion right remember that concept i told you but yes divided by two one four three three two four times hundred then that way it shows you the percentage contribution of services to the entire final consumption expenditure by households uh for 2013 so make sure you 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 take note of the year they are asking and you also take note of the component that they are asking if they say goods how much did goods contribute uh, and and listen to what i'm saying i'm saying goods right so by saying goods goods are not just durable they are also non-durable they are also semi-durable so in that case you would have to add them up so find the total for all your goods add them up divide by the total which is 2143 if it's 2013 and then multiply your answer by 100 that way it's going to take you to the correct answer because if you are not careful you might have the formula but you get it wrong because you are not being careful so make sure you 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 try to see which here are they asking about and also try to see uh are they saying goods in general or they specified durable non-durable whatever if it's services it's easy because yes we only have one we don't have durable service non-durable we don't have that all right 
So as usual, we end the lesson by looking at the activity. So I'm not going to help you. I can just go through the activity just for you to see. Okay, fine. What does C, G, I, X, and M in the equation C plus G plus I plus X minus M stand for? This is easy. You can get all 10 marks. Define the following and give two examples for each. Durable goods, semi, this is an easy activity. Distinguish autonomous consumption with induced consumption. This was supposed to be eight marks, but it is fine. It's four marks. All right, so this has brought us to the end of our lesson. Uh, and thank you so much for joining me in this lesson. And don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Thank you so much. God bless.